Well, now that I've depressed you, good morning. It's okay. It works out okay. Later, donkey makes waffles. So it's all good. I'm making waffles. Every time I make waffles now, I hear Eddie Murphy. I'm making waffles. So how many of you like waffles? Has nothing to do with the sermon. Just wanted to find out if you like waffles like I do. I might make waffles one Sunday. So we're in the middle of what's called Lent uh, by a lot of uh, uh, churches because it's 40 days until Easter. Actually, it's less than that now, but um, that's the reason. So some people have wondered, why does McDonald's all of a sudden serve in a fish sandwich? Um, because on Fridays, lots of Christians, including Catholics, give up meat in order to fast from meat for one day. And some people fast from other things. And the idea of a fast is just the idea of putting something away so that you can focus on God. And so I would encourage you, you know, in the next 40 days, take some time maybe to put your phone down for an hour and drive out to the water maybe and just be thankful for what God's done. Maybe just to take a, you ready for this? Walk and get away from the news. By the way, the news loves to repeat things. Have you noticed this? Hurricane season's coming and you and I will both watch that thing. That little... I think it's moving. I think it's bobbling. I think it's going. I think it's hour after hour, right? Because we're psychotic people. So walk away from the news and take some time and just say, God, I want to focus on what you've done for me. Now, I don't know if you've ever taken a good look at a rope or even a kite string. This is actually a survey string. But uh, even a survey string, as small as it is, is pretty strong. But do you know why? In the Old Testament, it says a, a, a rope or a strand of three... Cannot be broken. And if you look at the end where it's frayed, you can actually see the individual pieces that are then woven together. Even your clothes are woven together. Why? To make them stronger. Now, let me tell you something I know about life. As you go through life, there are friends and people in your life that are like this rope. Now, most of us have had an opportunity in our lives where we've gone through a hard time. And we've had somebody throw us a rope. Somebody who's there for us, somebody to walk us through, somebody just encourage you. A lot of you have been there for other people and thrown them a lifeline when they needed it. But we also know that there are people who when they throw their rope, there's a rock on the end. And they pull other people down. We all know somebody who maybe struggle with alcoholism, who has friends that pull them towards alcoholism, or somebody who struggles with drug abuse, whose friends pull them towards drug abuse. Some of us have family members who struggle with that. Why? Because they got around the wrong friends. Your friends can make a huge difference in your life. You do not need perfect friends, but you need friends. Who will lift you up when you're hurting. And that you'll be there. Every once in a while somebody will say to me. Well Eric I don't need church. I'm not you know dealing with this. Or that. I said yeah but maybe somebody else needs you. Maybe somebody else needs you to reach out to them. To be there for them. And by the way I would encourage you. When you need help. To ask for help. Sometimes we don't know to throw you a rope. Right. And so, and so feel free to ask sometimes when you're hurting. Today we're going to look at the very last chapter of the book of Romans. Whether you knew it or not, we have studied the whole book of Romans since January. Now we've skipped a couple of verses. Okay, a lot of verses. But, but we did our best to go chapter by chapter to go through the book of Romans and look at what Paul said to this early church. And today we're going to talk about three reasons why we need spiritual friends. I know that God uses our friends to change us and that we need other people to build us up. So we're going to talk about that today. But first I want to tell you a story. And this is me setting the table. And then we're going to go to Romans chapter 16. So years ago when I was working with the youth here. We went on a trip. And we went what was called whitewater rafting. Which really was whitewater floating. It wasn't even whitewater. It was more like brown water. Cold, cold brown water. But we got halfway down the river. And halfway down the river there was a rock that was about 10 foot Above the river, the 43 degrees river. And you could run off the rock and jump. And I had been talking to the youth about being brave and, and, and being challenged. And they looked at me and they said, Eric, you need to jump off the rock. Now, for those of you who don't know me, God made me under six foot on purpose. He said, Eric, stay. It says in the Bible, lo, I am with you always. So, so I know not to get up high because then, you know. 
That's sarcasm, by the way, for those of you who are like, really? Um, so anyway, so, so I don't like heights, but I thought, you know, I'm going to show them. And so my, my, my brain, I, I, in my rational mind, I decided I was just going to run off the rock and jump in. Right before me, by the way, somebody chickened out and slid to the end and then backed up, which is always a great thing when you're already nervous to see somebody slide on a slippery rock almost to their demise. So the first time I ran... And as I went to jump off the rock, my arms decided they did not want to leave the rock. And I reached back and grabbed the rock, which pulled me towards the rock. But the, the drop was only about three feet by the time I was done with these gigantic gorilla arms that I have. <laughs> by the way, I can reach anything. God gave me these on purpose. All right. So, and so I, I jumped in the water and I thought, that's it. And the students that were with me said, that doesn't count. That wasn't really a jump from the rock. And at first I started to rebel and then I thought, you know what, I'm trying to teach them to be brave. So I'm going to show them what it's like to be brave. And I had decided how I was going to do it. I was going to do like you do when you're weightlifting or you're doing something strenuous. I was going to do a manly, Rah! so I was going to run and go Rah! off the rock. So I got to the top. There was nobody in front of me this time. I ran as fast as I could, which was about an eighth of a mile per hour at that time. Right? And, and I jumped off the rock and I went, Rah! so I thought. When I hit the water, before I even came up, I could hear laughter, not just from our group, but from other groups of people around us. And I said, what happened? They said, you yelled like a girl. They had it on video. Erica, that goes to our church, who's now a vice principal, played the video for me. And this is really what it looked like. I kind of stumbled to the end of the rock and went <laughs> into the water. More like a female goofy version of myself. I did not go again. But I let people talk me into something I wouldn't have done. Let me tell you something about friends. Most of you at some point in your life got talked into doing something you would not have done if it wasn't for a friend. But you've also been encouraged to hang on and to pursue and to persevere at times when you were ready to quit because of a friend. Because here's what I know about you and about me. When you're doing what's right, there's times that you suffer for it. When you do what God wants you to do, there are times that people will actually attack you. And you will feel like you're the only one. But the truth is we need other people during those times of difficulty. So today I want to look at those three reasons why we need spiritual friends. Number one, because of people's gifts. For those of you who don't know, I'm an extrovert. How many extroverts do I have in here? Wait, let's try that again. How many extroverts do I have in here? Last service, I gave out $10 Visa cards. You're out of luck this service. Anyway, it's really true. I really did. Somebody gave me $10 Visa cards to give out, so I gave them out. Anyway, so how many of you are introverts? Oh, no, I'm not even going to have you raise your hands, right? <laughs> We're all different. So listen to what Paul says. He's talking about people in the early church, and I only have time to go through a little bit of this list. Romans 16, here we go. I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincre, and she's the one who brought the letter. And it says, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people. And so basically financially and other ways, she has helped many people. And then it continues, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their life for me. Time out. Now, this word in the Greek, they risked their lives for me, literally means to put your neck out. Now, you've probably heard that expression, put your neck out. You probably never thought about it. It is a term when somebody goes to the executioner. It means you risked your life, literally. You put your neck out because it was time and so it says, hey, they risk their lives. And by the way, in this time, it literally was risking their lives. I really believe we're going to get in, into heaven and, and other saints are going to come up to us and say, so did you have a struggle? On, oh, listen, it was such a struggle. I was pastor of a church. I got a mean letter one day. And I'll say, what was your struggle? Oh, my, my family was fed to lions. Oh, okay. I guess the letter wasn't so bad, Right. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epeninus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. So the first Asian, uh, uh, the first maybe China, we're not sure, and, and was the first convert there. 
And then it goes on to greet other people, and Paul mentions households, some who were related to the emperor at that time, who had the head of the household killed. Uh, so there's a lot of history in here, but there's also a lot of variety. He acknowledges all these women who made a huge difference in his ministry. By the way, you know the first people who told about Jesus' resurrection, you know they were women, right? People who complain that the Bible is sexist need to read it. And then it says this, greet one another with a holy kiss. And all the single men sat up. What? All the churches in Christ send greetings. So why does it say greet one another with a holy kiss? Because that was the culture at that time. And the truth is, it was men greeting men this way, primarily. And women greeting women this way. Now, I am not surprised at all that a virus is spreading around Italy very quickly. Because my brother-in-law is Italian. And my brother-in-law will inevitably kiss me once a week at some point. Give me a hug and kiss me on the cheek. Now, you got to realize, as a southerner, a guy whose family is about fourth-generation hillbilly, it was a little awkward at first. But after knowing him for about 19 years, I'm kind of used to it. And not only that, I'm tempted to go, Mwah, but I haven't yet. But it's normal. Why? Because it's a way of showing affection and love and care. It's the re... By the way, I've said this in all the services, Tom. It's just, uh, you just happen to be in this one. But, but, but so what's the purpose of a handshake or a fist pump or a... Now we have to do this. I guess we're supposed to bow to one. I don't know what we're supposed to... The feet. Somebody came up to me and did the feet this morning, the elbow. I don't care how you greet each other. But you should greet each other. Did you know they've done studies that when people walk past, they've done studies, people walk past each other, they've had a whole line of people on purpose not smile at the person they walked past. That person, even with no response, feels rejected by those people. It's human nature. So we should go out of our way for each other to acknowledge each other. Good morning, Kay. Good to see you this morning. I talked to Gary. He said you were in here. And I said, I never get to see her. And he's like, she's right there. I've had people get upset that I didn't greet them on Sunday morning. There's 300 people here between Saturday night and Sunday morning, and I'm an idiot. But you're welcome to say hi to me. We, I love to greet people. I love to say hi to people. I love to, to welcome you. If you want to give me a hug, give me a hug. I'm not worried about it. Don't hug my mama. But give me a hug. Say good morning to me. I don't care. Why? It's a way of showing that I'm concerned and I care for you. Let's greet each other. Let's go out of our way to bless each other. Let me tell you a story that happened this week. Because you think it takes a, a, a big deal to make something change somebody's life. It takes just something small. And CBS News this week, there was a little girl. Let me read her name this service. Her name was Nora. And Nora Wood was four years old and going through the Publix in Georgia. And as she went through the Publix in Georgia, there was a little old man coming the other way. And at four years old, Nora reached out to her mom's dismay, yelled, Hey, old man! The old man stopped and Nora's mom backed up. They actually have the video footage from this encounter. And, and the mom backed up and she said, Hey! And she said, and the four-year-old said, I want a hug. So the old man obliged and they took a picture. As the mom took the picture, the old man had a tear form in his eye. And he said, you don't understand how happy this has made me. The first time I've been happy in a long time. What Nora did not know is that this man's wife had passed away just recently. They actually carried this on the news a few years ago. And then Nora became friends with this old man. And she would get invited to his house and they would go for a walk and look at his garden. He even came to her kindergarten graduation. And just recently he passed away and she was at his funeral and his brother said she made him live four more years. Just because of a hug. Listen, you think it's something big that it needs to change somebody's life. It can be a text. 
It could be some encouragement. It could be somebody that God brings to mind that you say, you know, I've been thinking about you lately. Just wanted to see how you were doing. Send. Listen to what it says here in 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use only important gifts. No, whatever gift you have received to serve others. So if you know how to make soup, make soup. If you're lousy at making soup, don't make soup. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you about my gifting, okay? So, so a few years ago, I had my small group over my house. They said, hey, we're going to help you paint your house. I said, oh, that's great. And I started painting with them. One of the members came to me, took the paintbrush from me, and said, just bring us supplies, please. <laughs> I am the world's worst painter. A few years ago, our church had one of those paint things where they're going to teach you how to paint. When we were done with it, the lady who headed it up said, well, I guess it's really true that not everyone can learn to paint. <laughs> Mom, did we burn those? I think we burned mine. All right, okay. And then it says, receive to serve others, not to serve yourself, to serve other people. And then it continues, as faithful stewards of God's grace. So you've been given God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. By the way, your words can change somebody's life. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised. Not you. By the way, if you serve others for yourself, you'll figure it out real quick. Because you'll help somebody, and they'll attack you. No good deed goes unpunished. Right? You'll help somebody, you'll serve somebody, and they'll attack you. But if you don't do it for you, you don't care. You'll wake up in the morning, and the enemy will try to keep you from doing Oh, they don't appreciate you. They don't care about you. You don't matter. All these thoughts will come to your mind. Why? Because the enemy would rather you sit at home by yourself. You can't change somebody's life if you don't use your gifts. You have to go out of your way. And there's going to be times that you don't feel like it. Wait. Call the way ambulance, right? Because it's true. We all get that way. Why? Because we're human. And the enemy comes and says, oh, they don't care about you. You don't matter. You're the only one that helps. You've always done this. Nobody appreciates what you've done. You've done this for years and nobody cares. And people don't thank you anymore. And they even do that. And, and all these thoughts will come to your mind. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want you to help anybody. So you know what you should do? Help people anyway. And by the way, if you're around people very long, can I tell you something you're going to have to do? You're going to have to forgive them. I mean, if you come to more than one church service, you're going to be like, I can't believe he said that. And guess what you have to do? You have to forgive your pastor. Sometimes you might need to call him and go, did you mean to say this? And I'll go, no, not at all. And then it says may, that God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So let me ask you this question. Do I use my gifts to bless others? I'm telling you, it is so easy to not use your gifts. It is much easier to sit at home and watch TV. Because when you reach out to people, guess what? You're going to say the wrong thing sometimes too. Oh, no, not you. Oh, yeah. And sometimes you'll do the wrong thing. Sometimes you'll try to help somebody and you'll actually be doing something dumb. Been there, done that. But what do you do? You keep going. You say, God, help me to use my gifts. You've given me gifts. Help me to use them to bless others. Number two, so gifts and then guidance, guidance. Years ago, I remember Harold Brantley calling me. Now, Harold was from Texas. Harold was my mentor, spiritual dad to me. And Harold called me, he said, and, and I had been with a group of people forever. And Harold called me, he said, Eric, I want you to know something about those four men. He said, they're not your friends. That blew me away. I'm like, what? What do you mean they're not my friends? They've been my friends for years. He's like, well, they may call themselves your friends, but they're not your friends. You know what he was doing? He was trying to warn me about some people. Do you have a friend like that? Paul was a friend like that. Listen to this. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you learn. Basically, if people come and what they do is not line up with God's word, then be careful. There are lots of people today who call themselves Christians, whose business practices, they may have a fish on their car, but their business practices are not Christian. Do you understand? Some people will use that fish to manipulate people. Oh, I'm a good Christian. I've had more people that call themselves Christians trying to steal from other people 
They use God's name to manipulate other people. So Paul says, watch out for those people who say one thing and do something else. They may look good, but watch what they do. Watch what they do. Don't just because don't, just they say they're a Christian. Just because they say they're a church doesn't mean they're a church. Just because they say they're a pastor doesn't mean they love Jesus. Too close? Keep away from them. You didn't know the Bible said that, did you? For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. What are appetites? Money, food, power, control. There's churches right now that are being controlled by just a couple of people. Because those couple of people want control. It has nothing to do with trying to help people find their way home to Jesus. What is their appetite? And we always have to look in the mirror and say, God, don't let me be controlled by my appetite. Let me be controlled by love for you. And then he continues, by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone's heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what's good and innocent about what's evil. Basically, I want you to stay away from evil people. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. This week I got a phone call and a friend of mine said, Hey, Eric, have you heard of this guy? I said, what guy? He said, you heard of this guy, Dave Ramsey? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, kind of, we taught a class a few years ago. And he said, he said uh, you know, Dave Ramsey says this about loans. And Dave Ramsey says this about credit cards. And Dave Ramsey warns us about a lease on a car. He calls it a fleece. And he said he warns us about the interest rates on credit cards. And he talks about a budget. He said, you got to watch out for these things. I'm like, yeah. Here's what's amazing. Do you know how dumb we've been about credit cards? The government had to put on the credit cards how much you would pay if you didn't pay it off. You know why they had to put that? Because we just kept charging. And they had no idea that $10,000 was going to cost us $100,000. So we need people to warn us. To say, hey, watch out. Hey, make a budget. Hey, look at your life. Hey, be careful of those friends. Hey, maybe you should spend time with a few people learning God's word. That's what it says in 1 Peter. So then those who suffer according to God's will should quit. No, should commit themselves to their faithful creator. And then what does it say? Continue to do good work. It means that sometimes when you're doing what God wants you to do, it will be hard. One of my favorite speakers used to say, welcome to the cross. When you do what God wants you to do, sometimes you'll feel like, you know what? You could be doing something easier. You know what? Nobody else does it that way. Why, why are you working so hard? Nobody else is working as hard as you. Why are you the one washing the dishes? Nobody else is washing dishes. Why are you the one, right? Whatever the list is. We all have that list, don't we? You're the only one. And that's us building up in our pride instead of saying, God, you know what? If this is what you want me to do, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not talking about letting people take advantage of you. But when you serve sometimes, guess what? There are people who will take advantage of you. Here's the second question. Do I have friends that tell me the truth in love? That's what's a sign of maturity, by the way. Number three. So we've talked about gifts, guidance, and now we're going to talk about growth. Growth. We're going to look at what Paul says here, which is you need to study scripture together. You need to spend time in God's word. Did you know that Ford, Firestone, and Edison all spent time together in Stewart, Florida? You drive really cool cars because of that. Edison loved 12 volt. So here's the thing. Ford, Firestone, Edison spent time together. Who you spend time with influences you, affects you. This week we taught a class called How to Trust the Bible. It's called Foundations. And we talked about the foundations of the Bible. By the way, you can find that online. If you Google Foundations... Um, you'll find a class on the Bible, and it talks about why we can trust Scripture. Here's what it says. To him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden at long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings. Time out. What's he saying? He's saying, when you look at the Old Testament, you realize it's prophesying. It's telling us about Jesus. 
When we look at how they used to sacrifice lambs, how they used to put the blood over the door, that it was a symbol of what God is doing now through Christ. And then he continues, by the command of the internal God, so that all the Gentiles must come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Can I tell you how powerful the Bible is? I have a friend just this week. This friend is, is a friend of mine. They've been my friend since they were about eight years old. They used to, my mom used to have them over the house. And we were talking this week. And she said to me, she said, my friends are surprised when I quote the Bible. And I, and I wanted to say, I'm surprised that you quote the Bible, but I didn't. She said, but I'll tell them something like, you reap what you sow from Scripture. And they'll say, I thought you didn't believe that. And she says, it doesn't mean that there's not wisdom there. This is somebody who doesn't believe in God, but sees the truth of Scripture. Here's why I said that. If you're a Christian, and you believe in the power of Scripture, and you have the Holy Spirit to inspire you, and you have the Holy Spirit to bring it to mind sometimes, just when you're out somewhere, and God reminds you of the truth, how much more powerful should it be in our lives? Listen to what it says in Ephesians 3. For this reason I kneel before the Father to whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray. Now listen to this image. I pray that out of his glorious riches. How rich is God? <laughs> right? Glorious riches. He may strengthen you with power. Do you need that now? Have you prayed for that? Through his spirit. Where? In your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through Faith. That's why we talk about inviting Jesus into your heart. That's where this idea comes from. Did you know that? It's the idea of the center of your being. God, would you come into the center of my being? I want to allow Christ to be the center of my life. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You can't even know. It's beyond. You realize when we get to heaven, just the most loving day you've ever had is just a grain of sand to the beach of heaven's love. I mean, the best day you've ever had where you were the happiest, like you were, you were losing your mind, you were giggling because you were so happy. It's just a taste of what heaven's like. It's just a touch of the riches of God's love and grace. And those of us who have loved ones go ahead. That's what they are experiencing in heaven. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Why? So that you and I may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Here's a final question. Do I meet with others to study the Bible and pray? Because we need other people. Other people to help us grow. Other people to use their gifts. Other people that together can guide us and help us to become more like Christ. Because listen, we all struggle sometimes. And we need other people. Sometimes to throw us the rope. To pull us up. I know sometimes it seems easier to be alone. But ask God to give you at least one friend. That you can do these things with. That maybe you just call them once in a while. And you say hey I was reading daily bread this week. And here's the verse I came across. Or I was looking at my Bible app. And this is a verse that stood out to me. And just talk about scripture. And maybe even say to them here's where I'm struggling. And as you do that, God will help you to grow and understand his love so that you can be so full of his love that it flows out everywhere you go. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step you can take today. We don't have a formal invitation where people come down an aisle as I, we play a song, but after church... You can come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me and rose again. And I want to surrender my life to him. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, but the truth is you've been hiding. Maybe you haven't forgiven somebody who hurts you. And that's why you're hiding. Maybe it was a pastor. I'm sorry. Maybe it was a church. I'm sorry. We're just humans. Choose to forgive them and go out of your way to love those people around you. I know it's hard to love people, but God so loved the world that he sent Jesus for you and for me. So we have to ask him, God, fill me with your love so that even when other people don't act the right way, that I can love them anyway. 
My prayer is that would be true of our church. No matter what we go through, no matter what we deal with, that we would be a light to our community. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, first of all, for that one today who's struggling with knowing you, I pray that today, even in hearing your message, that they, their hearts would be pulled towards you. Lord, I pray for those friends that we have that don't know you, that we could be that rope to them that pulls them towards you. Lord, for that person that we know that's a Christian, but they're struggling. Lord, that we could be that rope that reaches out to them to show them your love and forgiveness and acceptance. And Lord, I pray for those who are struggling today that they wouldn't be afraid to cry out for help. To look to somebody to reach out and to say, I just want to talk to somebody. So Father, we invite you to continue to move among us. I thank you for these songs that remind us of how much you love us. Remind us again in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.